please. Okay, thank you very much, Katya, for the kind invitation and for all the organizer of this uh, seminar. And so it's a pleasure to be uh, virtually there. <laughs> I would like to be in person, but uh, yeah, it's kind of difficult. But anyway, it's uh, it's uh, still a pleasure to 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 see uh, at least virtually some of you. And uh, so I, I'm 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 really glad to 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 give uh, this talk. So what I would like to talk about, uh, uh, well, first of all, I, I have to mention that this is a joint work with Alessandro Felici. And what we developed is the following kind of idea. Uh, we wanted to construct a minimization problem, uh, which is uh, completely discrete and uh, uh, contains a regularization and whose solution is, uh, or hopefully, uh, should be a good uh, approximation uh, of the solution to the Calderon problem. And so the main feature here is uh, not only that this minimization problem contains a regularization, but that this is completely uh, discrete. And I'll try to show you how, you, how this uh, is, uh, is done. So, uh, well, the, I guess in this audience, uh, Calderon problem is very well known, but just let me mention a few of uh, some notation. And so let's start with the Dirac problem. So we have uh, the usual conducting body, which is contained uh, in uh, omega in our n. This works for any n greater or equal than two. And omega is just uh, regular enough, it's Lipschitz. And we consider that this conducting body is characterized by a conductivity. Uh, in this talk, I'm uh, going to just to consider scalar conductivities, but actually, uh, essentially everything I say works uh, in the anisotropic case, also for matrix valued uh, conductivities. So, but just for simplicity, let's think that I have this class of scalar conductivities, so sigma and L infinity, satisfying uh, the usual uniformly elliptic uh, condition. And I'm just going to be uh, keeping fixed these two constants, lambda zero and lambda one. And uh, so if uh, you have a conductivity sigma and in this class, and you, as usual, prescribe the current density, which uh, for simplicity, just let's uh, take uh, F, uh, which is in L2. This uh, star down here just means that the function is as a zero mean on the boundary. And uh, then, of course, the electrostatic potential U is just the solution to the usual Neumann problem. You have uh, elliptic equation in divergence form. In omega, you have a Neumann condition uh, where the Neumann datum is equal to F, plus uh, since uh, to guarantee uniqueness, you need um, to insert a uh, normalization and the normalization I just ch uh, choose is just that U as a zero mean as well on the boundary. So uh, the Neumann, uh, so, if you do previous experiment, what you can do, you can measure the potential at the boundary and due to the normalization, this is an L2 function with zero mean as well. And uh, if you uh, assume that you can perform this kind of uh, uh, experiment and this kind of measurement for any possible uh, current density F, what in principle you could be uh, thinking to measure is the so-called Neumann to Dirichlet map, which is just this bounded and linear operator from L2 into itself, but to each Neumann datum or to each current density associate the corresponding Dirichlet one or the uh, potential. Clearly, this is a bounded linear operator, but uh, this depends on sigma, and the dependence of sigma is nonlinear, and so this uh, makes uh, the inverse problem uh, actually nonlinear. And the famous uh, Calderon problem uh, posed in the 80s uh, is just to find out what the conductivity is, so what are the internal properties of this uh, uh, conducting body by performing this kind of electrostatic measurements at the boundary of current and voltage type, and that is by measuring, uh, ideally, the Neumann to Dirichlet map. 
actually, so I'm not going to discuss any of the, I hope this audience uh, more or less knows about uh, all the uniqueness results and uniqueness issues and stability results. So I'm not going to cover that. And, uh, but because I want to address more or less the uh, reconstruction issue. So what uh, kind of uh, numerical approach should be done in order to solve uh, in a reasonable way such kind of problem? The first thing that one has to notice, of course, is that uh, we really never know what the Neumann to the map because we cannot perform infinitely many measurements. And so uh, I begin by talking what kind of measurements really we can expect to, uh, to have in practice. Uh, and this is, uh, well, uh, David is here, I guess. So I guess the first real model of this is in this paper by Somer Salo, Cheney, and Isaacson in uh, back to 92. They call the, these experimental measurements. Now this is uh, maybe uh, better known as the complete electron model. Uh, but I, I like the experimental measurements uh, terminology, so I'm probably keeping uh, that. So what is the, the idea of uh, Somersano, Cheney, and Isaacson is, uh, okay, and the idea of uh, real experiments is that you have uh, uh, a certain number of electrodes. L is the number of electrodes. These are identified by some uh, subsets of the boundary with some kind of geometrical regularity, which I'm not going to discuss in, the, in this talk. And... Uh, uh, these are attached to the body, especially in the medical uh, applications. The, they are attached to, uh, to the body through a gel, and this creates a contact impedance, which uh, uh, might be not very well known, but we assume that this is just between two given constants, and each electrode could have a different contact impedance. Then what you do, you inject currents uh, uh, on these uh, electrodes. And uh, the prescribed current density here is given by this uh, vector in RL, where I1, IL are just the, current, the total current injected from each electrode, and you need to have this kind of compatibility condition. And then the problem that uh, is proposed, you have the usual equation. Okay, then you have a kind of uh, Robin type boundary condition where these UI are constants on each electrode and constants which are not given. Yeah, it's part of the, uh, of the problem, actually. You have no current outside the electrodes and the current which is injecting on each of the electrodes, uh, the total current is just this constant uh, I, I for any I going from one to one. And what you can do, and the, you measure the potential still uh, through these electrodes. And the measure potential is, so the potential on the electrode is again a vector, okay? And you can normalize it so that you have this kind of normalization condition. And this is just uh, the total uh, voltage uh, that you can measure. So it's just the integral of the voltage uh, uh, through on the electrode. And what they proved is that this the relation between this vector i and the this vector, uh, where is it, uh, i, and the corresponding vector v is just a linear one. And so this is, can be described by a matrix, which is an L times L matrix, which is usually called uh, the resistance matrix. So which is the one which to each current uh, associate the corresponding voltage. And this is the kind of experiment that you can really uh, perform. So you can think that depending on the number of lactose, you are exactly this, uh, uh, the information is encoded in this, uh, uh, in this matrix. Okay, I'm assuming, of course, one of the main difficulty of inverse problems is, is and in particular, this one is ill -poseness. And uh, so we need to take care of error. And this is how I define the error. So what I'm supposing is also on each electrode, you will have a, a instrument measuring the voltage. And I think that this instrument has a certain tolerance. It might have a certain error in measuring such a voltage. And I think that this error is given by this quantity epsilon. 
So epsilon is the noise level at each electrode. And this is important because uh, uh, of what I'm, I'm going to do, uh, explain immediately after. So as I told you, the uh, electrodes that we are going to satisfy some kind of geometrical constraint, which I'm not going to describe in detail, but they are, can be characterized by, the, by a parameter, which is this parameter delta, which is the first parameter, which is going to be important in our analysis, and which is the size of the electrode. So delta is the maximum of a diameter of uh, any of the electrodes. And the important thing is that I'm going to uh, let this delta goes to zero. And this means, uh, and there is, uh, due to this geometrical constraint, I can uh, observe that the number of electrodes is growing uh, in the following uh, way. So it depends like delta, one over delta to some power, okay? So it grows. And this means, uh, and this is a problem because we have an error at each of electrodes. So if electrodes is getting higher and, and the number of electrodes is getting higher and higher, the total noise will be quite uh, big. And so this is the, a challenge to check uh, that. So I am assuming that the, in the setup, I have a my unknown conductivity is, is called sigma zero, and it's it's a conductivity lambda zero and lambda one are fully fixed in this, uh, in this uh, talk. The exact data are this resistance matrix, which is uh, depending on sigma zero. And I put here a delta, just to remember that this depends on the kind of electrodes I'm choosing. So it depends on the electrodes, of course, especially its, uh, its size, it's an L times L matrix. And of course, the Measured data are, which is what is measured, is uh, this uh, matrix R epsilon, which is the noise, uh, and delta, which is depends on the electrode, which is an L times L matrix. And I am assuming that the error is of this order. So if at each electrode the error is of order epsilon, if you consider this uh, norm as the norm of, of uh, L times L vector, uh, the Euclidean norm as an uh, L times L vector, this error, it grows uh, with respect to L. Okay, that does not depend only on epsilon, but also depends on L. And since L is going to be quite big, you need to handle also this kind of thing. So uh, this uh, is a constraint, if you want, of, uh, of uh, how delta should go with respect to epsilon. Okay, so the, we are including a quite big error if you have a lot of electrons. And this is a kind of message. Okay, I am. Uh, I claimed that I want to have a fully discrete uh, minimization problem. So the other key point in this talk is going to be the discretization. So for simplicity, let's uh, assume that omega is just a polyhedron in this case. And I'm just using the, since I'm not really an expert in numerical analysis, so I'm just using the super basic kinds of finite elements you might think of. Uh, and uh, so I'm just uh, considering a, a regular triangulation of omega closure. And uh, I have uh, an important parameter, which is the discretization, which is just this H, which is the size of a discretization mesh. And so, which is a, simply a bound of a diameter, diameter of any of uh, uh, triangles forming this kind of regular triangle. Triangulation. So the triangulation is regular because it satisfies the usual assumption. And I'm just consider the space of discrete function, which is this uh, xh, which is just uh, the simplest one. So uh, continuous and uh, piecewise and piecewise linear on any of uh, uh, and piecewise linear. So we are uh, first order polynomial on any of these elements of a triangulation. And this discretization is used for actually uh, two things. Uh, first of all, is used to discretize the unknown conductivity. So the unknown conductivity will belong to a space of conductivity M intersecting, uh, intersecting with this uh, space of discrete uh, function. And so it's going to be an H. 
but also is going to be used to numerically solving uh, the Dirac problem. In any kind of numerical method, you might need to solve a Dirac problem. And so I want to uh, also uh, suppose that the problem, uh, the, also the Dirac problem is actually discretized and uh, we use the same discretization mesh, okay? Uh, this uh, is uh, maybe not optimal, but uh, to keep uh, the analysis uh, under a little bit of control, we adopted this, uh, this choice. Okay, uh, we are, I'm going to try to explain you a little bit of this, uh, uh, I'm going to, of this modification that I'm going to introduce. I want to introduce uh, the, this, which I call the resistance matrix, which is discrete and modified. And I want to uh, explain you what is happening here. So I have a certain number of electrodes and I consider the prescribed current density, which is usually given by this factor. And then I want to solve this kind of uh, problem, which is a very usual bilinear formulation of a problem. So I want to find UH in the discrete space, satisfying this is a bilinear form, and this is the kind of uh, function that I want to match. And then if I, UH is the solution to this, uh, which is a supposedly a discrete problem, as we will see, you consider the measure potential at the electrodes, which is a vector, which is just the integral of UH over each electrode. And then I call the relation between this I and this V is still a linear one. And is given by a matrix, which is still an L times L matrix, which I called discrete modified resistance matrix, because well, it's a resistance matrix because it associates currents to voltages. And uh, okay, so the terminology here, so this add st stands for modified. Uh, delta is uh, depends is just here to show that this depends on the electrodes that you're using. And this H is here to show that this is discrete and depends on the discretization, okay? Because UH is uh, uh, living in a discrete space. But what is uh, corresponding this kind of problem here? So let's just uh, consider its uh, strong formulation in some sense. So, uh, the discrete modified resistance uh, matrix is nothing else that solving uh, through a finite element uh, discrete solution to the following problem. So you have uh, the usual equation, plus you have that the Neumann condition is just given by this uh, Neumann datum is just a constant times the characteristic function of the electrons. So this is the usual uh, Neumann condition. And so essentially, this is just uh, the discrete formulation of this very simple Neumann problem. And let me uh, notice that if you assume that uh, here sigma is whatever you like, but if sigma is uh, discrete with the same mesh, as in the same mesh, and if you uh, suppose that any of these electrodes is the union of elements of uh, triangulation of the boundary induced by the, your triangulation, then this means that also this can be discretized on the same mesh. Oh, sorry. Uh, I guess. Okay, so I'll I'll do with uh, uh, with a cable because it stopped uh, sharing out. Uh, let let me let me try again. Sorry about that. Please take it down. Yeah, let's see if it works with uh, with uh, AirPlay. Otherwise, I, I I'll do it through the cable, which should be a little bit uh, more stable. Uh, no, it doesn't work. So let's let me check with a with a cable. Uh, uh, 
that it doesn't work. Uh, Okay, it doesn't work with a cable as well. That's that's weird. Sorry, let me let me check. Uh, it should be connected. Oh. Okay, doesn't uh, okay. Uh, I'll try once more, then I will just uh, let's see. Okay, now it works. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, so but the, the point is what I want to know uh, that you notice is that. This kind of problem, or best if you like, if sigma is belongs to this discrete space, and if you can choose the electrodes, and, and actually I will tell you that you can really do that as the union of elements of a triangulation, this problem here is completely discrete, okay? It's really, you can this, uh, put it in a completely discrete form. And uh, the other thing is that this is a numerical solution of a completely standard Neumann problem. So we are not solving numerically the complete electoral model, which is much more complicated. And so we are just using a standard Neumann problem. So hopefully uh, all numerical guy already have a, a code for that. It's, it's a completely standard Neumann problem, nothing really fancy or difficult, uh, it's not really the, the complete electoral model that we are solving, but a much simpler one. Okay. And then we can set up a, a discrete regularized minimization problem, which is the following. So epsilon is the thing that we are given by our measurements, and we want to solve the following minimization problem. So sigma belongs to the space of discrete conductivities. Uh, R epsilon delta is my uh, resistance metric, which I, I have measured. Epsilon is the error, delta depends on the electrodes. Then I'm just minimizing, here the norm is just the norm as a linear operator of the matrix as a linear operator from R L into itself. So this is the error. And I'm just using the, uh, discrete and modified resistance matrix, okay? So this is, which I can hopefully compute quite easily. I mean, if the problem there is completely discrete, so it's already in the framework of a, a discrete solution. And so I'm considering this, and then of course I need to regularize the problem to take a little poseness. So I'm adding here a regularization operator, Latikonov, and uh, so, a is the regularization coefficient, and this is the regularization operator. So we have three uh, 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 the parameter here, which are essential. One is the regularization coefficient A, one is H, which is the discretization, and what is, one is delta, which is, the, uh, let's say, the, the one related to the electrons. And okay, the choice of the regularization parameter depends on your a priori knowledge of uh, the conductivity. Let's say that I'm interested in the uh, discontinuous case. Uh, so typically the kind of regularization operator is something which is related to some kind of BV norm or BV related. Uh, so just to keep things, uh, uh, let's say, in a clear, let's consider that this, uh, we try to do this with a total variation penalization. So the, this operator is just the total variation of sigma. And this is the kind of, of regularity that we assume on the unknown. Okay, so what we have, we have that this problem is uh, a discrete problem. Okay, it's a fully discrete problem and uh, I'm not claiming and I'm not uh, studying the uh, resolution of this problem numerically. I guess this is still 
it could be a very difficult problem. Numerical instability might be present, but should be handled carefully. So I'm not saying this problem is non-convex. So it's uh, it has really uh, several issues, which I'm not taking into account. That's a numerical part, which should be uh, it's an interesting and difficult part. And I'm not going to, to talk about this because also it's not really my expertise on, on, this, uh, on this kind of thing. But what I would like to, to, to say, what I would like to understand is whether this discrete problem is really good. So if uh, uh, the solution to this problem is really a good solution or a good approximation to the solution of the inverse problem. So the question here is the following. Epsilon is, is given, is what it is. I would like to find uh, these three parameters which are the electrodes, the kind of electrode I'm using, the discretization I'm using, and the regularization coefficient that I'm using, such that if the solution, if I consider the solution to this problem, I would like this to be a good uh, solution, a good approximate solution. And so my question is, how many and which kind of electrodes should be used? So how to choose delta? What kind of discretization should I use and how and how to choose the regularization parameter? So in other words, I would like to find delta H and A depending on epsilon, such that I have the following kind of convergence result. So the solutions converge at least up to subsequences to sigma tilde, where sigma tilde is a solution to the inverse problem. So such that lambda or sigma tilde is uh, lambda or sigma zero, a solution of a continuum in this problem, so the Calderon problem. So they share with the unknown the same Neumann to Dirichlet map. This is my, uh, my aim. So in such a way that if you give me epsilon, if possibly epsilon is uh, relatively small, I can uh, tell you what to choose as delta H and A to have a meaningful solution to the inverse problem. This is what we, are, we like to, to know. And it's clear that, for instance, uh, the discretization parameter is not very clear how to choose it. So the problem is ill-posed, uh, exponentially ill-posed. So uh, it's clear that if H is very small, you have, a, in principle, a better resolution, but the ill-posedness might be very severe. So that's you should handle. If H is big, the ill-posedness is uh, much more controllable, but uh, the resolution is going to be very poor. So how to choose uh, the trade-off between these two things is not very clear. So uh, really that's uh, one, I believe, one of the key points to understand what kind of discretization should be, uh, should be really used. Okay, uh, there is a lot of uh, previous work. And uh, so on this kind of uh, problem, I'm, I'm mainly focusing on the Calderon problem for discontinuous conductivities in this case. So that is, uh, I'm uh, just uh, skipping a lot of interesting uh, work. Uh, but uh, the first thing that people try to understand in the first numerical works is uh, what kind of regularization should we use? And uh, typically, uh, the kind of uh, regularization was exactly of a BV type. So of BV related, like total variation or mount for char or again, total variation with a variety of uh, te numerical techniques. So in these papers by Dobson and Santosa, myself and Santosa, Tony Chan and collaborator with different techniques study this kind of, uh, uh, of problem. And uh, the first question that could arise, uh, actually, when I talked uh, on this problem back in 2000 and something, uh, Engel asked me if this was the, uh, uh, how the convergence of this uh, method worked. And uh, I didn't have the answer at that time, but uh, really, so one could question whether these kind of BV related regularization are the right ones. So if you have some convergence, if uh, a regularization parameter goes to zero in a suitable way, and the answer is uh, uh, yes. It was done uh, by myself in a few years later by via uh, a convergence analysis. 
And then the idea is, okay, this is just the first step. I wanted to move on and try to understand much better how this kind of uh, numerics. So the numerics works, but I want to understand what uh, the analysis can say about this kind of uh, uh, minimization problem and approaches, numerical approaches to the Calderon problem. Okay, there is also a lot of convergence analysis. So let me explain uh, what has been done previously. So the first paper in 2008 is what I told you about. Uh, and so it was done for the full uh, 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 Calderon problem with complete uh, uh, with continuous measurements with a Neumann to Grishland map. And actually there the uh, focus was just on changing uh, on considering the, the right regularization operator and on changing the regularization parameter. So only the parameter A was changing in that, guy, in that case. And uh, that was the main focus. But then I immediately realized that the discretization was really important there. And uh, then a uh, few years later, I consider both regularization and discretization on their non conductivity only. And, uh, and this gave me an idea of how H should be chosen. Uh, that was the important thing to understand how H changes and how H should be chosen in, in terms of, uh, of the error. And, uh, and so this is, was uh, uh, the second uh, work in this direction. But of course, there has been uh, several related works. So I like very much the work by Yvonne and collaborators. They proved that by this kind of resistant matrices introduced by Somersalo, Cheney, and Isaacson, if uh, delta, if electro parameters is very small, then these really are a good approximation of the Neumann to Dirichlet map. And this is a fundamental uh, tool that we, uh, we used to in our, in our, in our approximation. And then there is this very nice paper by Gere, Jean, and Lou, and they consider uh, discretization not only on their non conductivity, but also the direct problem. And the main feature there is that they are able to consider also some kind of curved domains, which we are not uh, treating, we are just considering a polyhedral case, but uh, uh, they are considering the, uh, uh, the complete electro model. But uh, they are just uh, letting all the other parameters fixed and we let, they let the change uh, only H. And uh, my opinion, the important thing is to have all the parameter change uh, at the same time. And in fact, this is our approach. So we want to perform all these kind of approximations simultaneously. Uh, so the, all the parameters A, delta, and H change at the same time. You don't uh, let one goes to zero well, the other is fixed and then let the other goes to zero. You go, uh, you keep uh, uh, changing all this in terms of, uh, of the error epsilon. And this, okay, makes the analysis quite uh, challenging in some sense because we need sharp quantitative estimates for each approximation. But also these estimates, uh, if you control with respect to one parameter, you need to control uh, these estimates uniformly with respect to all the others. And this makes the uh, analysis challenging. So we are using some of the previous estimates, but we need also to insert new ones to deal with this kind of, uh, uh, of problem. And the kind of result is the following. So the assumption we are known conductivity, we assume the a priori hypothesis is that sigma zero is a function of boundary variation. So the total variation is finite. And then we prove the following. So we say that A, we can choose A, which grows uh, is of the following kind. So like a constant epsilon from some, uh, to some power. H is also controlled by a constant times epsilon to some other power. And delta, again, is uh, changing with epsilon with respect to some power. 
And then if you have epsilon, which is a sequence uh, uh, of number going to zero, then up to a subsequence, uh, your solution, discrete solution are converging in L1, which is rather strong norm, to sigma tilde, where this sigma tilde is what I usually call the optimal solution to the inverse problem, optimal in the following sense. It solves the inverse problem, so it shares with the non-conductivity the same Neumann to Drischler map, and among all possible solution is the most uh, regular or one of the most regular in the sense that it minimizes among all solutions, the total variation. So this is linked to the kind of regularization we are using. And it's clear that uh, we cannot say that sigma tilde is equal to sigma zero. Unfortunately for BV function, we don't have uniqueness uh, unless we are in dimension two. And then as the Pivarinta uh, just uh, tells us that uh, the limit here without even passing to subsequences of this solution uh, is going, these solution are going to zero, to sigma zero in L1, okay? Without even passing to solutions. So this is telling you that we have obtained for this uh, uh, discrete problem, a solution which is meaningful for our, uh, for our inverse problem. So of course, this is the best you can hopefully have because the uniqueness is not guaranteed. Okay, so a few comments on this. So I can choose compatible polygonal LAC. Oh, one, one other comment first. Okay, the growth of this, uh, the dependence of this quantity, in particular H, is a polynomial with respect to the silo. This is, uh, one might think that H could change it logarithmically or exponentially with respect to epsilon. Instead, all these quantities grows uh, polynomially, delta, uh, H, and A. And these uh, are, this relation between H and delta allows us to construct uh, uh, compatible polygonal electrodes so that the direct problem is really fully discrete. Uh, the discrete direct problem I'm considering is a standard Neumann problem. So in principle, I don't need to know the contact impedance, which is not clear, very clear how to, how to compute. Uh, the number of electrodes grows, but grows polynomially with respect to the epsilon and to H. In other application, the growth needed to be exponentially. Uh, instead here it's polynomial. And we can handle the fact that we have many and many electrodes. So even if the noise increases with the number of electrodes, we can still handle that. And uh, uh, future work is extension to curve domain. I hope this can be done in somewhat near future and also to electrodes of arbitrary shape. So we don't want to be strict, uh, restricted to polygonal, polygonal electrodes. Okay, then I would like to comment on, uh, I will maybe uh, at the end, very end, I would like to comment about this contact impedance uh, uh, properties here. But uh, uh, let me just uh, have, I guess, some kind of 10 minutes left. So I will just give you a hint of a proof uh, uh, of this result. So, the idea of a proof is essentially by a, a gamma convergence or gamma convergence inspired technique. So the gamma convergence is a variational convergence uh, introduced by the Georgi in the 70s. And so the idea is the following, we re reframe the problem in terms of this kind of gamma convergence. So the minimization problem like this. So I'm just assuming that this coefficient A is scales like this. And then I just divide by epsilon to the power gamma. So I'm uh, just uh, rescaling this problem and the, I consider uh, to be minimizing the exactly this functional, which is exactly this if sigma is uh, discrete and it's plus infinity otherwise. Then I need to prove that this, uh, this f epsilon Gamma converges to F0, where F0 is just equal to the total variation if uh, sigma is a solution to the inverse problems and plus infinity otherwise. 
Okay, so if you don't know more or less what gamma conversion is, it's not really an issue. Gamma conversion is, is done by two parts, gamma, the so-called gamma limb infinite quality and the so-called gamma limb soup inequality or recovery sequence. And here, uh, more or less the difficulty is very similar, but maybe it's a little bit more challenging the recovery sequence. This is what will, I want to point out a little bit. So one key point is to find the recovery sequence. So if I assume that sigma tilde is such that the limit functional is finite, so this means that sigma tilde is a solution to the inverse problem with finite total variation. I want to find what is called the recovery sequence. This just uh, is, is the following. I want to find sigma epsilon, which belongs to the corresponding uh, a discrete uh, uh, conductivity space such that sigma epsilon converges in a one to sigma tilde. Its total variation converges to the total variation of sigma tilde. And the other part of uh, functional, which is this part here, just goes to zero as a, a epsilon goes to zero. Okay. So this part is the difficult part. So I want to, I need to add that this resistance matrix is going to minus this, is going to zero faster than epsilon to the power gamma. Okay. Uh, so the problem in handling this is that this resistance matrix depends on delta. So anytime you change the electrodes, we change the resistance matrix. It's a different matrix in a different uh, with different size. So we would like to have something which is uniform. So the this is essentially is due to Yvonne and collaborators, and essentially it is a there is a way to re, re, relate the resistance matrices to boundary operators. Okay, so you consider uh, this piecewise PC stands for piecewise constant functions, which are constant on each electrode, zero elsewhere, and this is with zero min. And uh, uh, you can consider a projection operator from L2 star into this piecewise constant and an extension operator from piecewise constant to L2 in such a way that the uh, if you consider the following operator, this is a bounded linear operator from L2 and L2, which uh, controls and is controlled by the uh, the norm of the matrix. So this is, somehow this is, allows us to uh, reframe the problem, whatever electron is, as a boundary operator, so we have the same framework uh, to be uh, to understand. Okay, the first thing that uh, Yvonne and, and collaborators proved is what I told you, is that if you consider the resistance matrix and you consider here the Neumann to Dirichlet map with respect to this uh, norm, if uh, delta goes to zero, so if a number of electrons grows with some uh, compatibility geometrical condition, which I'm not uh, discussing here, is uh, then this is going to zero. So these are delta in if you interpret it in this way, is a good approximation of a normal to Dirichlet map. So provided epsilon and delta are related as this, remember that this is uh, the constant L essentially. Okay, we have this error on the constant L, uh, so the number of electrodes, then provided this one goes to zero, this is puts a constraint on delta, you have that even if you have here the error of order epsilon with, on your resistance matrix, still this is a good approximation of your norm. And then we are just splitting the estimate into four parts. So what we need to prove is that this quantity here or uh, since uh, this uh, uh, is very close to this, uh, we by the Yvonne method, we can show that this uh, with uh, two, of course, extension and projection operator is close to that. Uh, we need to show that this uh, guy is goes to zero. Okay, this is what uh, is our aim. And we split the estimates into four terms. 
So the first term is the following. You consider lambda of sigma epsilon minus lambda of sigma tilde. This is the continuity of a Neumann to Dirichlet map with respect to the coefficient. If sigma epsilon converges to sigma tilde, you can prove that this uh, can be is elder continuous if you have a convergence in L1. And then you can guarantee that this is controlled by this uh, L1 convergence. The second step is, okay, lambda sigma epsilon, I am approximating with a solution of a continuum problem at the discrete level. So this is the Neumann to Dirichlet map for discrete solutions of a, direct, of a direct problem. This is maybe the most difficult estimate. And so I want to approximate solution of elliptic equation by their discretized counterparts using the finite element methods. So here we are using finite elements, but uh, there are some uh, uh, tricky parts which are not really uh, that easy to prove uh, uh, and to consider. But here, uh, sigma epsilon is fixed, but you need to consider that this changes, okay? A H epsilon is, uh, so H changes with respect to epsilon. This is the difficult part, okay? But this is more or less the idea. This is a discretization estimate. Then uh, I have uh, the I have a discrete Neumann to Dirichlet map and a discrete resistance matrix, and I want to approximate this uh, uh, as follows. And so this is like uh, we follow more or less Yvonne, but at the discrete level. And the difficulty, for example, here is what? Well, the idea is. Uh, uh, if you think of Yvonne, but what they do is uh, they take delta goes to zero, okay? But when I let delta goes to zero, actually my epsilon here is going to zero as well, and my h is going to zero as well. So I need the same estimate, which is uniform with respect to h and this epsilon. And that's the difficulty of, uh, of, of proving this part. But essentially, we try and we manage to do it using uh, uh, more or less the idea introduced by Yvonne. And the third, the fourth term is just I take the resistance matrix and I approximate it with a resistance with a modified resistance matrix. So I'm just replacing the complete electro model with that difficult contact impedance problem with a, a, a usual Neumann, uh, Neumann problem. And this uh, say that the contact impedance does not play a significant contribution. And I want to be a little bit more precise about that. So, if you think already in the Ivone and collaborators uh, result, we are approximating the Neumann to Dirichlet map by resistance matrices. And clearly the resistance matrices, the, the Neumann to Dirichlet map does, to, does not contain any contact impedance in that, while the resistance matrices has. So already in that result, it tells you that at the limit, of course, as delta goes to zero, you can, uh, in a sense, uh, just forget about the resistance matrices. And this is exactly what we have, uh, are doing here. So at the limit, you don't see the contact impedance. It's clear that if you are keeping a discrete level, if you are fixing a number of electrodes, it's clear that the contact impedance uh, might play a role and might play a significant role. And there is this very nice, uh, a series of paper by uh, essentially by Samoli Siltanen and collaborators where they studied how the computation is affected if you don't know precisely some parts of the model, the boundary, the position of electrodes and the contact impedance. So it's clear that at, at a fixed level for a certain number of electrodes, that plays a, a significant role. But if you are able uh, possibly to go up to the limit when the contact impedance role, uh, uh, in this case, uh, just uh, disappear. And, uh, okay, I think I can uh, uh, stop here, but I would like just to end the talk by the advertising something, which I very like. Uh, so there's been launched by the uh, American Institute of Mathematical Sciences, which publishes a new uh, a new journal, which is entitled Communications on Analysis and Computation. 
So I belong to the editorial board, but the main editor and uh, uh, guys uh, responsible for launching this are Abiba Marie, Ong Yu Yu, and Ming Yu Shong. So I invite you, I think it's a good uh, possibility to exchange ideas on related to analysis and computation. So it's, I think the inverse problems community could really enjoy this kind of interplay between these two fields. And so I, I, uh, I invite you to submit uh, one of your next papers to this journal and maybe we can build a, a very good journal. It just started, but uh, we, uh, I hope uh, it could be successful. And so let's uh, just uh, a little add uh, for this. And uh, with this, I think I can stop. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Luca, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Any questions or comments, please? Any questions or comments? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Luca, once again, for the very, very nice talk. And thank you very much, okay. everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.